Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I didn't know you preferred Mike. Uh, thanks so much, Mike, for the invitation and the kind introduction. I'm actually glad I can't see anyone out there right now because not only am I always horribly nervous doing things like this, but because I have a confession to make. This is not the talk that I thought I'd be giving today. Not at least three months ago when Michael and Melissa Barton reached out to ask me to do a Mondays at Beinecke talk. Not indeed when I finally proffered the very patient Mike Moran the title for the talk just about two weeks ago. Oh, I knew I'd be talking about Maureen Dallas Watkins, partly because I simply dote on her work and partly because I've been so busy that I had to reach for a topic in my comfort zone, about which more later. So yes, this talk was always gonna be about Maureen Dallas Watkins, that paradox, the obscure sensation, the little known success story of the drama school. But when I chose the subtitle, Recognition and Regret, I thought I would be talking about her feelings, not mine. Still, that's what time in the archive can do for you. If you're patient and open and just that tiniest bit lucky, you go in with an idea of what you'll find, hope to find, think you know you can be, think you know can be found, and that's when seven odd boxes of extremely random correspondence, ephemera, drafts, old school musings, a handwritten will, and a father's little red book full of Christian precepts and biblical factoids shake you from your preconceptions and rearrange themselves into a poignant and pretty humbling narrative. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with the beginning. Maureen Dallas Watkins, born to Georgia and George W. Watkins, who was a minister and a farmer. Maureen was a daughter of Kentucky, whose birth records have gone missing. Was it Lexington or Louisville? We're not sure. On her application to the then Department of Drama at Yale in 1925, she gives her birth as July 27th, 1898. And there's no real reason to doubt that, except that I've seen it as 1896 in other places. The family moved when she was still young to Indiana, where she attended Crawfordsville High School. In school and throughout her youth, she had a passion for dramatics, organizing and writing plays and skits. When as a senior in college, she transferred to Butler University, one of at least three colleges she'd attended, she pledges Kappa Alpha Theta at Butler, which we know from an entry in her 1918 uh, November newsletter. We were all registered, but had not attended all of our classes when the first flu ban was called closing the college for all non-military students. Now, after four weeks of vacation, revised programs, registration, another flu ban, flu masks, and peace celebrations, we are hoping to get acquainted with our books before exams come. We have had so few fraternity meetings that little has been done, but we can count ourselves most fortunate to introduce the following pledge, Maureen Watkins, a senior who came to us from Transylvania University. So amid global strife and a raging pandemic, Maureen made her mark. She wrote a skit for the Valentine's Day celebrations of Butler in 1919. But almost as soon as she'd arrived, it was time to go again. This time she made her way east to do graduate work at Radcliffe College, a decision that would change everything for her because that's where she'd meet that Svengali of the American University theater scene, George Pierce Baker. Baker had graduated from Harvard and had been there teaching rhetoric almost from that very moment. Because the reception to the drama had been cool from his alma mater, he approached Radcliffe College across the way and asked about starting English 47, a, a class in playwriting. Soon there were Harvard men joining in, which brought the inevitable return to the Crimson Fold. English 47 spawned the 47 workshop, and it was there that Baker trained likes of Eugene O'Neill, Philip Berry, Mark Conley, and Sidney Howard. Watkins enrolled in Baker's English 47 in 1919-1920 and in 47A in 1920-21. She was an apt pupil, but he counseled her as he did many of his pupils to go get some, se some seasoning, some experience. This she did with a devotion that marked all her interactions with George Pierce Baker. By early 1924, after a stint back in Indiana, she headed to the city of big shoulders and bold as brass newspaper men, Chicago, and landed a job as a cub reporter, giving the women's angle to the crime beat. She spent a little less than eight months writing for the Chicago Daily Tribune. And with a luck that would pretty much hold her whole life, she was assigned to cover a series of murders that would set her up for good. First, there was Belva Bell Gartner, a 40 something cabaret singer who shot her young lover in the front seat of her car with her gun parked in front of her apartment building. 
The police who had passed her entering the car just minutes before found her in her apartment, completely plastered and raving, covered in blood, claiming not to know how the young man died. Less than a month later, Beulah Annan, whom the paper is called the prettiest uh, woman slayer on murder murderesses row, shot her lover in her own apartment while her auto mechanic husband was at work. It seems the fellow told her that he was through with her, to which she objected in 38 caliber style. It later emerged that she had shot him at about 2 p.m. and had proceeded to play a record, Hula Lu, for four hours as she fretted about what to do, fearing to check for a pulse because, quote, he was too bloody. When her husband came home, the police were finally called. And when the coroner got there, he decided that the victim had probably only died about 15 minutes before. Both women would ultimately be acquitted. But that would not be the case with Watkins' next assignment. Again, only a month or so later, when two bored young men of privilege, Leopold and Loeb, decided to see what it would be like to murder a younger boy. After that, the beat cooled down and Watkins was assigned to write on fashion for men and women to write film reviews. And as September rolled around, it was time for her to gather her experience together and approach Baker in his new digs in New Haven, Connecticut. Baker had been hired by Yale to take uh, the 24-25 year to get his shop set up his curriculum in place and his staff hired and students admitted while a new theater was designed, a site for it settled with the benefactor Edward S. Harkness, properties for surrounding businesses acquired and negotiations with the Dramat over their use of the space and their share in the new department were conducted. Watkins was one of those happy few admitted that first year to the new program, which was conducted actually over at 52 Hill House Avenue. She had an idea for a play. However, she had no idea of moving to New Haven because that would mean giving up her day job at Macmillan Publishing in Midtown Manhattan. If you care to read about the coy and charming back and forth she conducted with Professor Baker on that score, you can do it in this article online in the 2010-2011 annual magazine of the Drama School. These scraps of paper you see adorning this, uh, this slide and in the subsequent pages of the article landed in my campus mailbox in an envelope in 2010 with a request to write the article. I was in awe of being handed such delicate and irreplaceable documents, but I was careful with them and returned them to the marketing office whence I got them, who indicated that they would turn them over to the library. But I've not been able to find them again, though I've tried very hard to retrieve them for this talk. When you're in the archives, as librarians and archivists know, you can become a feather in the wind of many folks billowing idiosyncrasies. But back to Maureen and her idea for a play. It will come, I hope, as no surprise, having heard the summary of her Tribune work, that her idea was to become Chicago, the story of Roxy Hart and Velma Kelly, the extremely thinly veiled Beulah Annan and Belva Gardner. George Pierce Baker, Baker thought the play excellent, giving Watkins a 98% grade, purportedly the highest he ever doled out. As he had a custom of sending his strong, the strongest of his students' plays to powerful producers, Baker brought it to the attention of Sam Harris, who liked it and decided to produce it. And so Chicago became the first play sold to Broadway to emerge from the new Yale program. For her Broadway debut, Watkins went to work to make improvements to the text large and small. One of the real pleasures of work in the archives is close reading of draft versions of our objects of study. There are multiple copies of Chicago and other plays and stories in various stages in Watkins papers. Take a look at the typescript of an early version and you'll see a lot of blankety blanks peppered throughout characters' speeches. But in published versions, you'll, it'll, you'll see that it becomes, you goddamn tightwad, or you goddamn louse. It seems the minister's daughter left room for the colorful, colorful intervention of her collaborators where she could not write things like that herself. Now those collaborators changed a little bit over the course of the rehearsal about an out of town tryouts. The leading, ladies was Jean, leading lady was Jean Eagles, an actress composed of one half talent and one half temperament. As opening neared, she engaged in a fit of pique so sharp that she got the director replaced. And then after she'd gotten her own way on that, she walked out of the show herself just a few days later. So as New Haven gave ear to a young Yaley's maiden voyage on the angry sea of the commercial theater, the now legendary wizard of Broadway, George Abbott was at the helm and Francine Lattimore, whom Maureen had wanted all along was playing Roxy. The old Watkins luck was still holding all right. Baker was delighted that his fledgling was getting an airing just down the street at the Schubert, but other members of the Yale faculty were less impressed. Professor John Clark Archer of the Divinity School was possibly positively seething about the, uh, the way the subject matter reflected upon the university and was not shy about saying so to the university president and to the newspapers. Of course, to Sam Harris and George Abbott, this kind of publicity was just gravy. Chicago did strong box office and ran for 172 performances. Watkins was enrolled for her second year at the Department of Drama. 
But as offers came in for her to work, and as there was no degree yet being offered to keep her in school, Baker agreed it was time for her to leave the nest again. Soon she had a commission to adapt Samuel Hopkins Adams' political potboiler, Revelry, for Broadway. Adams was a muckraker whose novel was about the Harding administration and the Teapot Dome scandal. I was introduced to this still timely play by Murray Weiss, a tireless literary agent with exquisite taste, who represents the estates of writers like Watkins and Shirley Jackson and Damon Runyon. Though this second Broadway show didn't go quite as well as her first uh, effort, she would get a third bite at the Big Apple in the form of a very funny play that was called An Old Fashioned Girl. The play is about an actress named Lily Darnley, a diva who drives everyone around her around the bend. Beinecke has a fascinating document, the stage manager's copy of the play, complete with a floor plan, contact sheet, and props list, and all marked up with cues and cuts. I want to thank the librarians at Beinecke, particularly Mary Ellen Budney, for taking such care in copying these manuscripts for me. Watkins was revising the play to make it stronger and having uh, after having retitled it from its original So Help Me God, when for once her luck failed her. For it was late 1929 and the stock market crashed and the Great Depression began and her backers all fell away. So Help Me God would have to wait until just a few years ago, a mere 80 years after it was written, for Murray Weiss to secure its New York premiere, directed by Jonathan Bank, after the original director left for personal reasons, and starring Kristen Johnson and Anna Chlumsky at the Lucille Lortel. But in 1930, it seemed to Maureen Dallas Watkins like it was a good idea to head for the hills, the Hollywood Hills. Hollywood had snapped up the rights to make a silent film from Chicago starring Phyllis Haver. But the verbal barbs were impossible in the silent medium and the satire was hammered into melodrama. The film did well internationally. You can see here the German poster, but it greatly uh, denatured from its original. Still, the talkies were taking over and Hollywood needed dialogue writers, not just scenarists for the first time. Ben Hecht called the opportunity for writers in Hollywood quote, the fresh air fund for New York newspaper men. Okay, so in Watkins case, it was Chicago newspaper women, but opportunity had knocked. And I believe that while George Pierce Baker prided himself on always being a molder of playwrights and primarily, he would never match the success in that vein at Yale that he'd enjoyed at Harvard. It's pretty easy actually for me to assert that Maureen Dallas Watkins is among the most successful writers Baker turned out in his Yale tenure. And that's not counting the inevitable fate of Chicago, which makes it a champion by a wide margin. Watkins next achievement was as a credit as was uh, as a, a credit as story writer on John Ford's 1930 film Up the River, which is a strange but morally sophisticated and yet innocently romantic effort about two felons, Humphrey Bogart and Claire Luce, who meet in prison and fall in love. It also stars a young Spencer Tracy as a kind of Macheath character who prefers to be comfortable in jail and leaves pretty much whenever the whim takes him. He always returns. You can see this strange picture on YouTube and I recommend that you do. And then came her work as a contract writer on a picture called Sob Sister in 1931. And from the posters here, you can see that newspapers figure prominently in this story too. It need no ghost come from the grave to tell us that her time at the Tribune was paying dividends for uh, Maureen here again. And while Watkins was decidedly not a sob sister, which is a term for a lady journalist who uses purple prose to elicit tears and hanging sympathy from her readership, she knew the breed well from Belva and Beulah's trials even from the Leopold and Loeb press pool. And this is where Watkins' of habit of uh, artful recycling shows again. She had made the eight, her eight months on the paper uh, the vein that she mined for her first professional play. I remember reading her April 5th, 1924, page one article about Beulah in court. She cupped her chin in a slim white hand with its orange blossom ring and didn't blanch as the state read her answer to the question, why didn't he get that far? Darn good reason, I shot him. I remember that orange blossom ring from somewhere. I went digging in the typescript of Chicago and there it was. There are so many efficiencies to be discovered in this way. From her article on Leopold and Loeb where she speculates that not being able to booze and carouse will help them look fresher faced at their trial, she writes, still poised and self-possessed and prison life where they've done without wine and women and song has helped them physically. Then she puts such a sentiment about Roxy into her reporter's mouth. Save the bedoozling tears for the jury, sister. For jails, the best beauty treatment in town. You take the rest cure a couple of months at the county's expense, you lay off men and booze till when you come to trial, you look like Miss America. As I read more of her newspaper work, I became fascinated by her thrift. There was the article about women's hair, though Bob, uh, Watkins never bobbed her hair because her father disapproved of short hair on women. It was called Bobbed Wigs and Wigged Bobs is Fashion Decree. And it ran in the Tribune on April 24th, 1924. Quote, 
While he talked, Mamzelle, a $20,000 a year expert, demonstrated a permanent wave and with its 20 electric curlers, turned an innocent girl into Medusa for half an hour. It was at that moment that I remembered that Maureen Dallas Watkins had written one of my very favorite films, Libeled Lady in 1936. 12 years after she had written about permanent waves, this scene appeared in the film. If you've not seen uh, Libeled Lady, you're depriving yourself of one of the great Hollywood comedies. It stars Myrna Loy and William Powell, the Thin Man franchise, just two years after that original appeared, and Spencer Tracy and Jean Harlow, here, the innocent girl who has been turned into Medusa. Like Chicago and Sob Sister, it is a newspaper story, with Tracy as the editor of a New York paper whose foreign correspondent, Soust, has submitted an item characterizing a society snob, Myrna Loy, as a husband snatcher. She and her father, brilliantly played by Walter Conley, are suing Tracy's paper for $5 million at the height of the Depression. When Tracy hears the figure, he quips, five million bucks? Why, there ain't that much money. He hatches a plan to hire William Powell to trap Myrna Loy into making the story retroactively true. Powell will make a cross-ocean voyage with the rich girl and bring a photographer along from the paper. He will trick her into a compromising situation and spread the evidence all over the front page. The only thing is, if Loy's going to, <clears throat> if Loy's going to be a, steal a husband stealer, Powell needs a wife. So Tracy offers up his long-suffering fiance, Jean Harlow, who wails, oh, the things I do for this newspaper, Warren Haggerty. Needless to say, before long, Harlow's Gladys is in love with Powell's Bill for real. And Bill is in love with, Con with Loy's Connie. Libel Lady is actually so great, it was one of the first comedies to be nominated for Best Picture by the Academy Awards. As soon as she wrapped up Libeled Lady, Watkins began work on Saratoga, which would be Harlow's final film. The young star died of acute nephritis just 26 years old with William Powell, her real life fiance at her side. And while the studio had considered recasting and reshooting her scenes, there was such an outcry from the public and so much of the principal photography had been done that they decided to finish the film by employing both body and voice doubles in some very wide brim picture hats. Then Maureen Watkins did some uncredited writing on another newspaper picture, too hot to handle with Clark Gable and Myrna Loy. And then she wrote the original story for I Love You Again, another charming Powell and Loy vehicle. He plays a milk toast amnesiac who gets hit on the head after nine years and recovers his real personality as a dashing and slightly shady con man type. Of course, the milk toast is married to Myrna Loy who has grown to loathe her sappy and safe spouse. Powell must both pretend to be the boring businessman and awaken enough of Loy's amorous interest to keep her from divorcing him. It's another picture well worth your time to view it. And I think it, is, it was on uh, TCM just a few weeks ago. So it's probably still available on the app. Watkins had worked hard during her half decade or so in Hollywood. And she took herself on a big trip to Europe and Asia. Her passport is part of Melissa Barton's exquisite exhibit now at the Beinecke, Brava, Women Make American Theater. But here we have another photo of Watkins on that trip. It says, the perfect lady tourist, camera under one arm and lunchbox under another. Black glasses, umbrella, sun helmet. I'm certainly working hard at having the world's best time. Love, me. I'm not sure to whom this has been sent, but it has that characteristic brio and self-deprecation at the same time that mark all of her writing. It's clear from her resume that Maureen Watkins could write high and low, sentiment and zingers. She was a sought after collaborator on a string of A pictures with big stars. So it has always been a little surprising to those of us who study her work that at that point in her life, Maureen Watkins began a kind of slow withdrawal that would become precipitous soon enough. The first step came in 1936, late, when she moved to the Chateau Marmont. Here's a postcard she sent to a relative in New York with an X marked on the, on the card to show where her apartment was, but around the corner facing the mountains. She recalled her new place was quiet and pleasant, which she said made it a big change from the studio. While there are a few, a few original contributions that emerge after this move, like the story for I Love You Again, most of the rest of her filmography would require no additional input from her. There's a remake of Up the River and one of Liable Lady called Easy to Wed, starring Lucy. And then there's a 1942 remake of Chicago called Roxy Hart with Ginger Rogers in the title role. As you can see from this lobby card, very little of the original Watkins in, um, intent is, uh, of her almost 20 year old play survives. Instead of a satire meant to indict the entire systemic failures of various institutions, the police, courts, prisons, the media, even marriage, the piece becomes a star turned for an already famous dancer in tap pants. In fact, in this version, Roxy didn't shoot the guy. 
So about a decade later, when Gwen Verdon read the play and saw potential in it as a musical collaboration with her husband, Bob Fosse, and they went a calling on Maureen Dallas Watkins, now installed in Jacksonville, Florida, she was unpersuadable. The answer was no. The young classics scholar who had been so inspired by the rather fussy Harvard professor of playwriting that she abandoned Greek and Latin for the down at heels press rooms and courtrooms of Cook County, Illinois, before writing a hit play and turning a very successful hand at Hollywood had come back around to herself. And this is what I meant at the top about my confession. I had considered Watkins considerable success and thought that anyone who abandoned that, who in fact, as she did, rather dropped off the radar of scholars tracing her movements for 10 years before appearing in a Florida phone directory, had suffered a schism or a crisis of mental or spiritual dimensions. But keep on looking for her in the archive and you'll see a different story emerge. This is nothing more than the back page of a girlhood uh, writing exercise in a three ring binder from Bible school. But I found the fact that she was reusing disused stationery from her family farm made perfect sense with her ability to recall and reuse details from her time at the Tribune in her Broadway and Hollywood work. And as I write on the slide, there is also a manuscript employing company letterhead with abandoned attempts to type a business letter as part of this portfolio. With characteristic modesty, she has labeled it sentimental value only, very early writings while taking Baker's English 47A. It was sent to her as Morris Watkins while she was living in Chicago before becoming a, a member of Baker's class at Yale. But it's not the earliest writing of, her in the, of hers in the collection. In some handwriting that is undated, but is clearly not in the decorative, feminine, confident, and blessedly readable hand that she will develop as an adult, she has written a series of theological, philosophical meditations on a great variety of subjects. They are numbered. The one pictured here, entitled Crutches on Which we leaned, it, We've Leaned, is number 14. And you can see here it says that man starts out life as the most helpless of all beings. In number 10, she embodies an almost stereotypical Midwest early 20th century Protestant attitude, the true minister's farmer's daughter come to the fore. Quote, the financial side of life is the feeder of the other three. It provides the funds so necessary in all lines of activity. As we learn to love this, which seems to add so much to life, we are inclined to follow it to an extreme, thinking that the more we get of it, the more we'll add to life, which it does not seem to do after a certain passing point. We call this the breadth of life because its use in many ways broadens one's life far beyond that of one who is denied its use. It enables one to travel and observe many lands and peoples and customs, to read, converse, and associate with cultured people, and in many ways makes a fuller life if one knows how to use it. She had had her trip around the world. She had comfort and security for the rest of her days. Another remarkable document at the Beinecke collection is her handwritten will dated 1955. 14 years before her death and never altered. She names her mother and Ann Carpenter of Indianapolis, her executors. I'm not sure whether, she, uh, whether or not she predeceased one or both of them. In the will, she makes provision for academic prizes in classics, in translation from the Greek and Latin. She remembers Christian colleges and Ivy League universities. Her stock portfolio is meant to supply these bequests. IBM, Standard Oil, Dow Chemical, Union Pacific Railroad, Hess, Corning, DuPont, Eastman Kodak, GM, Gulf Oil, Honeywell, International Harvester, Merck, Monsanto, Pfizer, and Union Carbide. What a good investor she proved to be. At the time of her death in 1969, 30 years after she had stopped working, she was still worth more than two and a half million dollars. And that was without saying yes to Gwen Verdon and Bob Fosse, who would secure those rights after her death to her estate to make Chicago the musical vaudeville a multi-billion dollar affair. In a way, it's too bad, though those 15 years between her no and the estate's yes may have been crucial to the project, because I think she would have approved of Fosse, Candor, and Ebb's treatment of her play. In fact, in one of the best interventions of the whole musical, it comes in the, uh, in the final number with Roxy and Velma singing tongue in cheek after they've said, you can life the li like the life you're living or live the life your life, live the life you like. You can even marry Harry or mess around with Ike. It goes, in 50 years or so, it's gonna change, you know, but oh, it's heaven nowadays. When Fosse's Chicago opened in 1975, it was 50 years from the original. And in just three years from now, it'll be 50 years from Fosse's opening night. And we have seen the erosion of these institutions that Watkins spotlighted even further. For Maureen Dallas Watkins to imagine the America of Donald Trump, where a presidential candidate could brag that he could shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and get away with it, and then be elected, and then set about for four years proving that that was the wannest boast that he could have made, would not have been possible. 
what would the minister's farmer's daughter have made of us? She was no rigid moralist, of course. In number 15, casting out the poisons, she writes, some things build while others tear down. Life is a taking in and a casting off. Some things that are food for some are poisons for others. Our natures call for different elements. You must determine what your nature demands and supply it. One substance may offset the effect of another. Hence, it is impossible to lay down set rules that will apply to every individual. The best we can do is get some general principles and make our own application. Being moderate in all things we do and making changes gradually. We desire to call attention to a few of the most common destroyers of life. They are the short, narrow, and shallow. They keep us from the abundant life. When I think about these quotations and that piece of girlish handwriting that sets out the heading, most needed thing, school of how to live, I'm moved by a notion that Maureen Dallas Watkins' entire trajectory makes sense. Rather than regret her retreat from screenwriting, the playwriting, and the story writing with which she had delighted me before I knew her name, before I knew that we were alumni of the same school, that we were both daughters of that Midwest, my time in the archive has persuaded me that to paraphrase Candor and Ebb, she did have it coming. She had it coming all along, what she worked for, how she wished to live, where, and how quietly. And if I fail to grasp that after my time in the Beinecke, well, to continue to paraphrase that masterful musical vaudeville, I only have myself to blame. Thanks. I think I can speak on behalf of uh, our 106 audience members. Uh, that was marvelous. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank and you. And we invite audience members to pose your questions in the Q&A. We'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. I wanted to begin with a archival practice question. You are in the archives a lot, but uh, uh, there was a time when you weren't and you and you started. And I wondered if you could tell your own archive story, how you got into archives. And our audience has people who are in the archives all the time and people who've never been in an archive. And if you might speak to those who haven't, things you've learned along the way, sort of uh, uh, tips of the trade for those who may not yet be fully initiated. So how did you get into archives and what have you learned that might be useful to others who want to get into them? Yeah, that's a great question because, as I said, uh, when I wrote the first document, the, the first article on, on Watkins, that stuff was just in my mailbox in an envelope. And uh, the awe that I felt opening that envelope and taking out a telegram from George Pierce Baker, taking out Maureen Dallas Watkins application to the School of Drama, I felt I shouldn't I shouldn't be able to hold these things. And I and I think, well, certainly they, they I think they had been in the registrar's file and, and, and had, had gone to press and marketing and then were supposed to go to the library. I think so. I think that the awe that you feel about an archive is is something that you need to get over in order to really engage with the archives. And, I, and I've I've you know we have wonderful guidance from the from the librarians at manuscripts and archives and at the Beinecke about how to care for the documents that we're interacting with. But there is absolutely no substitute for the thrill you get in being connected to the person or the uh, theme or the the idea that you're studying than to actually be in physical contact. With, with a piece of, uh, uh, of that record. Um, and so I think what I would say is be bold because the guardrails are there in the person of, of, of the marvelous librarians and they'll help you um, to treat the, treat the objects correctly, but you will, you, there's no substitute for actually being in, in their presence. And it's somewhat related that the drama school is a fantastic as an institution and its people, certainly you are. Uh, a great exemplar, great users of the special collections uh, here at Beinecke and MSSA and in Haas. And so you're really great dramaturgs in particular, but not only, but but uh, the school really is. And I wonder if you could just reflect from a pedagogical standpoint and from a stage standpoint, what it means to be, uh, to have access to archives for students in their learning pedagogically, but you're also obviously a practical place that, that Mount shows what it means and how it might uh, impact the uh, the viewers as well as the other members of the cast uh, and, and, and crew in addition to dramaturgs. So, so what does it mean to have archives for learning and for production? Well, you know, it's, there's no better way to be in touch with intention, with an author's intention, than to actually look at their, look at the typescript with things that have been crossed out, things that have been changed. And, and those of us who work in the theater know 
those kinds of things get changed for lots of reasons. You know, um, you've got an actor who's who's better at physical stuff than than linguistic stuff, so you, you cut back on that. But a future a future uh, actor playing that role might be that might be just the reverse. And so to have the archive and to be able to go and as I say, look at these draft versions. I remember working on. Uh, Trouble in Mind by Alice Childress, uh, first at Center Stage and then up at Yale. If you go to the Schomburg Center and you'll see 11 draft versions of Trouble in Mind with, you can, you can, you can feel Alice Childress chafing as she's working at changing the play for its announced Broadway opening, which would have been two years before Raisin in the Sun. She would have been the first black woman to have uh, a straight play on Broadway. She couldn't bring herself to, to make the changes that the white producers were demanding. And you can you can feel that in the archive. And so you know you know when you're going to put on a production of Trouble of Mind, you look at those 11 arrangements of the of the play and you and you can pick the one that's the, that's the strongest for your current for your current audience. So I mean I think things like that are 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 um, invaluable to, to to a theater practitioner, to to have to have um, access to diaries and and you can you know um, you know though Don Powell's whose, whose diaries are just behind me over there um, are are published diaries diaries that are not published of playwrights in rehearsal you can understand what they're going through you're like just those letters of that um, that um, Maureen Dallas Watkins is writing to, to George to George Pierce Baker about what do I do about Jean Eagles? You know, well, what she did for one thing is she, you know, Eagles, that that was one of those problems time took care of. But then she turned her into the heroine of heroine of the play, an old-fashioned girl, um, or so help me God. So um, but you don't you wouldn't know that without without access to the archive. Audience member asks, and I'll quote, how was it that as a woman she was accepted into Yale at the time? So I wonder if you could give a context both of the drama program and, and uh, to the extent you know other uh, academic programs on campus at the time. Well, I think, of course, the the, the last um, uh, big initiative before before COVID was the 5150 at Yale, and the 50 stood for uh, the the time at which women were admitted to the undergraduate program, and the 150 was the number of years women had been admitted to graduate and professional schools at Yale, and so women have been coming to Yale for 150 years. I mean, it, it, it's it's not great that it's been within my lifetime, um, as long as that as long as that's been that women that women have been admitted to under to undergraduate study. But um, Maureen Dallas Watkins was a part of a was a member of a of a first year class of playwrights that was about half women, almost almost half of them were women, you know, Baker admitted um, uh, uh, the uh, black playwrights. He admitted uh, international playwrights. There are a couple of Chinese playwrights, and um, so it, it, it's it wasn't that unusual. The School of Fine Arts was was very early um, in in admitting women to in, to their to their ranks. Uh, another question from an audience member: How was Watkins regarded by Hollywood? Did she receive the recognition it would seem she deserved based on her high profile scripts, or was she treated less respectfully because she was a woman? Well, I think, you know, if all of us know about the front page and all of us know about, you know, 20th century and all of those things are, are, are sort of Hecht and MacArthur's inventions coming right behind Maureen Dallas Watkins and we don't know about Maureen Dallas Watkins, I think we can, I think we can surmise how, um, how Hollywood treated her, treated women in general. It's, it's, always, it's always been the case. But I, I think what I found out in the archive is that there was a kind of contentment in, in Watkins and a kind of refusal to play games, to play, to play the game um, uh, in Hollywood. And, and that, that she had it sort of her own way. Um, I wouldn't say you know, that, that's not, that doesn't make it just or right, but, uh, and she's certainly not the only person. Um, I think you know, one, of, one, of those, one of the great films of, of all time about Hollywood, of course, is, is um, Sunset Boulevard. And and you and you can see the way that William Holden is treated, uh, you know, you know, as opposed to Betty Olson character is treated. So I mean, I think that that it's there's no question that women have been and, and sort of remain second class citizens in lots of ways, more and less insidious. But I think there was also a there was also a, a place of Watkins was a very centered person who sort of knew what she wanted and um, and and had things her own way uh, uh, quite a lot. Um. Audience member, uh, in addition to thanking you, which many audience members have uh, uh, said uh, how amazing it is to get the viewpoints and life experience that you've shared and, and quote, I would have liked to meet her. And I imagine that something you could say, do say, uh, why do you think she's less well known in campus mythos? You and I were talking a little bit before we started. I'm sort of surprised in the sort of 
20 top things that are said as people are walking around campus. You know, the author, the, the first play out of the drama school was Chicago by Maureen Dow. How come do you think she's, she's not more known? And leading question, might we be hearing more about Maureen Dallas Watkins from you? Uh, well, yes, uh, that, the, the, I'll, answer, I'll answer the leading question first. I mean, I'm working currently on, a, on the 100 year history of the, of the drama school, which is, which is coming up. And so I, I hope to, to, to write some of those wrongs for not just for her, not just for women, but for other students who, uh, who, didn't, who didn't get their due. Um, uh, and I think that partially, listen, we think of Chicago as a Bob Fosse, as a Bob Fosse musical. He produced it. He wrote the book with uh, uh, with Candor and Ebb, and and he directed it. Now, I I've only recently found out myself that it was Gwen Verdon who read the play Chicago and brought it to him. So I mean, even um, even between Fosse and Verdon, you know, Fosse Fosse takes preeminence. It's it's just you know that we used to we used to laugh about you know behind every great woman, man behind every great man there's a, there's a there's a there's a woman. We're behind. That, that that sort of has been what what has happened, um, and I think that that's partially. I think that the rebranding of Chicago um, has uh, has been has successfully uh, sort of um, uh, uh, obfuscated Watkins' contr contribution. Even though Chicago is very faithful to to Watkins' story, you know, I mean, it it you know from Mary Sunshine up, you know, I mean, it, it, from from the from the cell block tango, from he he reached they, we both re they both reached for the gun. That's first of all, that's also a quote directly from her her trial coverage. You know, th that was one of the you know the baby, the 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 pregnancy, all of that comes from from comes from Watkins' play, which she actually took from from um, from the actual trials that she covered. Question from the audience, and again, an archival question. Somebody writes, they're astonished that so much of her material survived, particularly given that she walked away from the business, uh, as it were, uh, three centuries, uh, three decades before uh, her death. And could you talk about what you know of, of the fact that so much survives and, and wonder if you could talk some about the provenance of, of how it came came here. She's a minister's farmer's daughter from the Midwest. That's how it survived. She was organized. I mean, you, you heard the stock portfolio. She hand wrote her will and then didn't change it. I mean, she, um, you know, she and she kept and recycled everything. I mean, she she reused. She saw use. You know, she, you know, bless this food to our use. Whether it was actual food or 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 intellectual food, she was willing to um, to contain, to remain, to organize, to reorganize, to reuse. And I think that you know her. Her heirs um, uh, and her estate were in inherited the paper. Now, for the person who said they'd like to meet her, I would love to have to have met her. And there's the personal that's missing. You know, the personal day to day we don't have. You know, we don't have like Don Powell kept a diary, and it's it's gold. Um, uh, the, the 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 regret for me is 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 not having that insight into into the daily life of, of Maureen Dallas Watkins because she sort of didn't, she didn't leave us that. Um, but her, you know, her, her estate has taken good care of her papers. The, the Beinecke has great, you know, has great copies of, um, of stories like Bound. There's a marvelous short story called Bound, several um, copies of it about a deaf and dumb young man and um, an old wizened farmer uh, wife who takes him on as an orphan and, um, and and a murder that's committed. Um, it, 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 there, you just you just you just wish that that she had uh, had a, a greater hearing. But um, the the archive is in, is in pretty good shape as as far as her professional life is concerned. Related to archival research, an audience member uh, who has done work themselves in the Harvard Theater Collection asked if you have done research on Watkins in the Harvard collections. I haven't gotten up there yet. I'm. I have a lot to look at up up in up at Harvard, but um, and I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to uh, to encountering her again up there. Program note: I've just put in the chat two events upcoming on Thursday. The next in our art and protest series will be drawing from work at the Queens Museum uh, on cultural strike, art and museums in the age of protest, and next Monday at Mondays at Beinecke we'll have another show about drawing from Melissa Barton's show Brava. So I encourage all who can to come to those. Um, thinking about Brava and the show, uh, Watkins is in conversation with lots of other uh, theater makers, theater doers, theater archives. And I wonder if you could 
think some, you know, talk some about who you see her in conversation with, and as you've been doing work on her, uh, who else sort of are in the network and, and constellation of the time that, that you have her in conversation with? Well, that that period in which she was writing, both uh, for theater and for and for uh, film, was such a rich period, um, particularly uh, particularly for theater. You know, what I was saying about George Pierce Baker never turned out the playwrights that he. You know, you know it's hard to it's hard to come up with bigger names than O'Neill and Barry and Conley and Howard. And I mean that that's that would be hard to replicate anywhere. But he had also stopped focusing just on playwrights and, and decided that he needed a more holistic training for a, an entire theater school. And what he started sending out, he, he, the, the early Yale feeder was enormous to, to Hollywood. And then it became really important to television as well, really early television. Um, the, the, the students would take one act plays all the way up to Rochester, New York to a television station up there and, 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 and do their plays. They made a film um, uh, in, in the forties about, about the work at the drama school. And so uh, I think the thing about uh, the, this period Watkins, uh, you know, I, I mentioned, I mentioned Don Powell, I've mentioned Hector MacArthur. There is a kind of, Again, the word brio, I, I like that word brio. There's a kind of, 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 of engagement, of spirit of, uh, that is common to all of these people. And part of it is that camaraderie of the newspaper man, the person who has to turn out his work real fast, the person who's got a, who's got a, who's, who's got a capture um, uh, uh, narrative and, and whip people's emotions into a frenzy in, in, a, very short, in a very short period of, of, of a few lines and stuff. That kind of writing got injected, that kind of energy got injected to both Broadway and and Hollywood in that period, and 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 they were all they were all comrades. There was the Algonquin, you know, the Algonquin Roundtable, and um, you know, folks who would pop in and out of that, like the Benchleys and the MacArthur's and the Hex and Helen Hayes, and and then there was then they all they all met. They did. There was the New York. It was the New it was Fresh Air Fund for New York newspaper men out in Hollywood when they need they needed writers. So it, there was a great. There was both camaraderie and 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 fruitful rivalry um, among among all those writers. You know, John Dos Passos and and John How uh, and John Howard Lawson and, and all those guys that that um, uh, that were writing for the group and for the theater guild. And you know, um, it was it was it was a time of such enormous uh, energy um, that that was that connected journalism. Uh, theater writing and film writing at, at that period, and 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 the the nexus the nexus uh, really was um, uh, uh, a real battery for um, for American literary output. Um, it sort of flows from that marvelous response, and an uh, audience member asked in particular about female creative camaraderie during the time. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a little bit of that, you know, the, as Oscar Wilde says, they just be calling each other sister. Well, women never do that until they've called each other much, much worse first. I mean, I think that, you know, um, uh, thinking about uh, it, it is a rather, it has been a rather zero sum proposition, you know, um, well, people will count up people will, producer will count up the number of play, the lady playwrights they have in the way they won't cut up the number of male playwrights that they have in the, in that period. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I don't know about a lot of, um, female camaraderie, it's sort of the, of the salon type that you might've gotten in, in the 18th, in the 18th century. Um, uh, there, but there was a kind of healthy competition, I think that, that, uh, they, they drove each other, um, in that way. I mean, Powell, John Powell is, hysterical on other writers. So I can really recommend your, your checking out, um, checking out her, her, her letters and, and her diaries. It will reward you. Well, that's, why wish, that's why I wish, that's why I wish that Maureen Dallas Watkins had, 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 I'm sure her, her diary would have been kinder, but just as insightful and, and amusing. I can imagine many people uh, at home have been writing notes and, and I uh, put it in the chat, we will publish a recording of this and I know I'm going to go back for notes of things to go read, as well as you've helped my uh, uh, on-demand queue with all your tips. <laughs> I think somebody was asking, will there be a recording so they can make sure they don't miss out on the on the various shows that you suggested? Uh, another question or so from the audience, and then I'll have one closing one. But before the question, I want to just quote some of the audience reaction. Uh, Brava, terrific talk, uh, absolutely outstanding. Thank you so much. Lots of thank yous. And perhaps my favorite, uh, asterisk, insert roar of applause, asterisk. So, uh, and I, I, I think 
that uh, is all that my mom <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not it's not a blood relative or other legal legal uh, uh connection to you as far as i know um so uh another uh uh sort of question uh from the audience and then I'll, as i mentioned have a have a uh, closing question so quoting again uh, from the audience member i am curious as to what extent the archives reflect details of the collaboration between dallas watkins and mr abbott how did they work together as playwright and director that is in those lost documents that were in <laughs> i mean if there's not a lot there's a couple of letters about working with george abbott um in, that that are in that clump somewhere and i'm going to find it i don't know where i don't know where it went after it went um from press and marketing i'm sure it's i don't you know michael and i were talking about beforehand is like is it at beinecke is it at manuscripts and archives you know a lot of the, i mean more in dallas watkins papers are at beinecke uh, the yale school of drama records are at, are at manuscripts and archives um some of that but, you know, it, it's a great chance to play detective um to 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 work in the archives and and to and to use the the finding aids that that are there to sort of think it's a little bit like if doing the perfect Boolean search to get exactly the 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 thing that you want to find uh, uh, on a on a search engine. It's that kind of um, uh, uh, pleasure that you get from from seeking out those things. She enjoyed working with George Abbott. George Abbott was a godsend. Um, uh, as as was she was so relieved when Jean Eagles dropped out um, and Francine Lar Laramore was allowed to take over. That I mean, it really it really did strike me as I was in the archive that she she had a great deal of good fortune. Even the fact that the depression canceled canceled her third Broadway show meant that she went to Hollywood and 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 again you know made enough money to live comfortably and live the way she wanted. Uh, so, so two final questions. Uh, the first is one, I'm going to be that guy. Uh, you're a dramaturg. What's that? Ah, what's a dramaturg? You know, there's so many, I, I, I people who know me know that I used to say, drama, well, what's a dramaturg? None of your damn business. And, and it's, <laughs> and it's almost always right because who's a dramaturg? Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think some of the, some of the ways that I describe it uh, more uh, in a, in a more friendly vein is, uh, you know, uh, it's like an, an in-house critic who's friendly to the production, whose interest is in improving the production. You know, it's someone who's minding the forest while the director, the actors, the designers, the stage managers and theater managers, all those folks at TDMPs are all there minding the trees. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of trying to maintain uh, a shape uh, and a connection to intention. Um, sometimes you're, you're holding, the, holding the writer's hand, whether that's across the table or across centuries. Sometimes you're holding the director's hand, whether that's across, whether across the table or across a bar. I mean, I think that, um, what the dramaturg does is is facilitate to make things better um and uh and and in a, in a way that you know you're you're asked for your opinion you have to say difficult things with generosity and sensitivity and um you're you're meant to be able to to provide context again whether that's across millennia or or across minutes ago when someone said something that was that no nobody else held on to so those are some of the ways that i talk about dramaturgy Thank you. And, and uh, as you know, I'm a fan of dramaturgy because of you and, and have been. Catherine once gave a talk uh, about uh, her profession. And I said to her afterwards, if everyone saw this, they would be saying to their children, grow up and become a dramaturg. And I, I mean it when I say that the school here is as great as it is in no small measure because of the power uh, over time and in this time of its dramaturgy. So. Final question, uh, but before I get to that, a, a, a closing quote from an audience member. I love this and it's really true what you've done in this time together. Quote, what a way to make the archive live. <laughs> so you really uh, have done well in bringing Maureen Dallas Watkins and the archive to life. Uh, so the final question is a simple one, I think, or a prompt. Uh, uh, I said, and I mean it, you are a catalyst for liberation, joy and freedom, but I think I'll boil that down uh, even more. You've got fantastic brio yourself. You brought it uh, today. These are not uncomplicated times that we've been living in. Uh, perhaps no times are, and, and they're tough times in many ways, uh, up and down times. Uh, where are you finding fuel for your brio? Um, you know what? I find fuel for my brio in my interactions with you know the, the students, with uh, my faculty colleagues. I find it in 
um, new work that is exciting. I find it in old work that's getting a new look in. Um, as some of my colleagues know, I'm an enormous champion of a, of a Zeronial Hurston play that I'm desperate to, to, to see done with colleagues here at Yale. And I, and I feel like it's on the verge of happening. And that's um, a, a great source of joy. Students of mine will know for decades that I've asked them to read this play and write about this play. Um, so uh, about the Zeronial Hurston play. So those kinds of, you know, I, partial, I think it partially, except that the word has gotten the bad press, a dramaturg is also an evangelist. You know, you could be a completist. You know, if, if I start, once I start on Maureen Dallas Watkins, I want to read everything. That's a dramaturgical impulse. Once I read something of Maureen Dallas Watkins, I want to read it again or see it, I want to see it again. And that's a dramaturgical impulse. And, 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 once, I, and once I see it and hear it and, and, and take it in and love it, I want to spread it out. And that's another, that's another dramaturgical impulse is to, is to spread, is to spread the word. So prepare ye the way of Maureen Dallas Watkins of Zora Neale Hurston. That's one thing that gives me a great deal of brio. Well, you had a congregation of 106 today on behalf of all of them. Amen. Thank you so much for all that you do, Catherine. And thank you, especially for this hour together. It's been a real blessing. Thanks so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. Thanks to everybody out there. <laughs>